this one. My name is Tasha Gluck. Um, I will be co-chairing the session with Samaya and I'll let Samaya introduce herself and just share some of the housekeeping um, details. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Tasha, and welcome everyone to the session. Um, so my name is Sumeya Ibrahim from Cochrane, South Africa. Um, so this morning, uh, just in terms of some housekeeping, uh, everyone is muted and um, should remain so. Uh, if you do, uh, once the presentations are over and if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and we can unmute you. Uh, the session will be recorded. Um, and we can proceed. Thank you, uh, Tasha. Thanks, Samaya. So our first speaker this morning is Lindy Matibula. She is from Cochrane, South Africa, uh, at the Medical Research Council. Uh, thanks. Good day, my name is Lindy Matebola and I will be presenting on prospective registration of COVID-19. I will be taking you through the introduction, data and methods, inclusion criteria, results, significance of results and concluding remarks. Vaccines have played a critical role in controlling disease outbreaks. Hence, the proliferation of the development and testing of multiple vaccine candidates during the COVID-19 pandemic. This should be informed by the best available scientific evidence. Randomized trials constitute the summit of the hierarchy of scientific evidence on the safety and efficacy of vaccines and other healthcare interventions. We have searched the South African National Clinical Trial Register Center and the Pan-African Clinical Trial Registry PECTA on the 22nd of October 2022. We went on to search the WHO ICTRP on the 24th of October 2022. One researcher conducted the search combining the search terms for COVID-19 in PECTA Center and the ICTRP. The researcher then created a master data file where the search output from the databases was combined. Two researchers screened the titles and brief summaries for eligibility and excluded ineligible trial records. They then assessed remaining records for eligibility, resolving discrepancies by discussion and consensus with a third researcher. The final list of included trial records was arrived at by consensus among the three researchers. Our search found inclusion criteria. We defined eligibility criteria as trials with at least one site in an African country, assessing the safety, immunogenicity and or efficacy of new or existing vaccine for prevention of COVID-19 infection or a disease. We also included trials that were assessing the efficacy of interventions for improving uptake of COVID-19 vaccinations. Our search found 17,603 COVID-19 records, where we excluded 17,386 non-African trial records, non-vaccine trial records, and duplicate records. We've assessed the full, the full records of the remaining 217 potentially eligible records and excluded 17 non-trial records and trial records not focused on COVID-19 vaccine. 
Our results show that majority of the trials, which were about 95% of the COVID-19 trials, were registered prospectively. And when looking at the country where the principal investigator was based, we found that for 72% of the trials, principal investigator was based in Africa. When looking at the phase of a trial, we found that 41% of the trials were phase three trials. We went on to categorize by age and we found that 86% of the trials were recruiting participants 18 years and older. And when looking at recruitment status, we found that majority of the trials, 56%, had a not yet recruiting status, followed by those that were recruiting for 41%. We also found a small proportion of 11% of the trials that had summary of results in the registry record. When categorizing trials by papers, we found that 88% of the trials focused on new COVID-19 candidate vaccines, while 7% assessed effects of repapered vaccines, which were BCG, MMR, and OPV vaccines, amongst others. And we found that 5% assessed effects of strategies to increase COVID-19 vaccine uptake. When looking at country of recruitment, we found that among the 147 trials, 54% of the trials were recruiting in South Africa. And then we looked at the recruitment sites and we found that 33% were single site trials, while 39% were recruiting from multiple sites within one country and 28% were recruiting in multiple countries. We lastly looked at the sponsor and funder countries. We found that trials were sponsored from the African countries where recruitment took place in 29% of the trials and were funded from the recruitment country in 16% of the trials. Outside Africa, most sponsors, 21% and funders, 19% were from the United States of America. We found that there are generally few vaccine trials conducted in Africa relative to the rest of the world. The limited vaccine trials in Africa could be attributed to limited expertise and resources, both human and material, as well as lack of perceived market. It is reassuring that many of COVID-19 vaccines are planned being conducted or have been conducted in multiple African countries. But there is a need for more African public sector funding for vaccine trials in the continent. In conclusion, we find that most trials are registered prospectively. However, majority of these trials are not updated even at 12 months after completion by date, where most remain not yet recruiting. There is a need to increase clinical trial data transparency, especially in the midst of a pandemic. Researchers are encouraged to update their records regularly and provide results in a public platform to uphold the ethical mandate to, partic to participants and research that contributes to their medical knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Lindy. That's really interesting and seems like it was a massive undertaking. So well done with that. Um, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand or write it in the chat. While we wait for any questions that might come to mind, um, Lindy, I have a question for you. What do you think would be a way to improve the reporting once people, because you said there's an uh, issue with trials maybe being registered but not being updated. So 
I suppose two questions. The first is, do you think that African trials are being underreported and how can we improve that? And then once they are registered, how can we encourage the updates? Thanks. So Maya, can you just unmute Lindy? Yes, I'm gonna do that now. Uh, Lindy? Uh, thanks, Maya. Uh, thanks, Tasha. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so there is a generally underreporting of uh, trials, I do believe. Um, so what we can do when the trials are registered, what we are looking to do within the trial registry is to be able to send some kind of an up, um, 12 months update message to say that researchers must come back to update their records because we do believe that maybe sometimes they have forgotten to come back and update their records. And then within South Africa, uh, the interesting thing is that we have the, the SAPRA, which uh, ask uh, researchers to update their records and send that uh, a printout of that record to them as an update. So that actually helps in South Africa for the researchers to be able to update their records. But generally, there is no legislation around it. That's why we cannot force researchers to be able to come back and update their records. We just send them those update uh, emails for them to come back and update their records, but it's generally the responsibility of the researcher to come back and, and update their records. Thanks for that, Lindy. That's interesting. Maybe a gap in some policy. Yes. Um, do we have time for one more question, Samir? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, I'll just read it from the chat. Thanks to uh, Ramond. Uh, very interesting that you looked at age groups for trial recruitment, but report proportion of over 18s. Could you perhaps comment on how many trials recruited those over 65 years? Did you examine this? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, no, we did not break down the, the ages. We just looked at uh, those that recruited the over 18. So we actually didn't look at each and every age category after that, just over 18. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Lindy. Um, that was really interesting. We're going to move on to our second presenter, which um, that's Olochukwu Lavith Obiora from the University of Advertisement. Thanks. My name is Ali Chukula Vetsoviola, and here at Foodland, postdoctoral research fellow at the University of the Witwatersrand, Johannesburg. I'm presenting this research titled Perceptions of Human Movement Researchers and Clinicians on the Barriers and Facilitators to Health Research Data Sharing in Africa. These are my co authors. This is the outline um, for the presentation. When we talk about research data sharing, we mean making research data available for other investigators and the benefits of research data sharing, sharing are en 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 enormous. You will see a lot of that in literature. Then when we talk about human movement res researchers and clinicians, we refer to researchers who are that's individuals who are conducting human movement research. And when we talk about clinicians, we mean um, people who attend to the healthcare needs of people in the field of human movement. This includes both the um, physiotherapists, the sports scientists, the podiatrists, and so on. The aim of this study is to describe the perceptions of human movement researchers and clinicians on the barriers and facilitators to health research data sharing in Africa. We employed the qualitative descriptive design, and this was um, an Africa-wide study. So the interviews we are done online, we um, recruited participants from the five regions of Africa. We aimed to recruit participants from the five regions of Africa, but 
all efforts to get participants from Central Africa was unsuccessful due to technological issues. Um, some of them couldn't um, stay online and due to internet issues and couldn't take long calls, also due to electricity and internet problems. Qualitative content analysis method was used to analyze the interviews and um, trustworthiness was ensured and methodological triangulation of the sources um, was also done. This is the characteristics of the interview participants. Most of them had um, postgraduate qualifications. Now, these are the barriers and facilitators to the research data sharing. The barriers and facilitators were grouped into five teams. The first one is the researcher clinician gap. Almost all the participants from um, the four regions reported that there is a kind of gap um, between the researchers and clinicians, partly due to ego and then partly due to um, the fact that clinicians have, have, um, have no motivation to get involved in research in some of the countries. They said they had no CPD points awarded for involvement in research, so it seems as if it's a waste of time for them, and they don't use they are not promoted based on that, unlike those in the academics. Also, time constraints um, was a major issue reported, especially by South African clinicians. They said they have to um, meet specific number of patients, attend to specific number of patients in a day. So they have serious time constraints for them to be able to collect data and share data. Now, the, facilitate, the, the, the good news is that researchers, um, that, that clinicians have a most data at their disposal because they, at, they attend directly um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the patients and the clients. However, these barriers, which includes also poor knowledge about data collection and data sharing, affects the use of this enormous knowledge at the disposal of enormous data at the disposal of the clinicians. Then technological pros and cons were reported. A participant from Sudan mentioned that they have no electricity and um, talk much more of having internet and um, talk much more of having even um, access to databases and so on. So this uh, makes data sharing to seem as if it is a, an impossible ta um, thing for them for the researchers and clinicians from the country. Then participants from Nigeria also reported that they have epileptic power supply. Several institutions are not subscribed um, to databases, so their staff have no access to, 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 uh, to, to, publication, to research publications, and they have no access to databases. They also reported that in their hospitals, the computers available are mainly for administrative purposes and they also have no time to collect data. Also, cost matters were reported. Then bureaucracy and ethical factors were reported. Some participants were um, worried about big companies using their data unethically. Then the current used patients informed consent does not include data sharing. This is um, an issue that is um, a problem all through um, the African continent. The, Patients informed, con con uh, patients informed con con consent most times don't have um, is um, information about the permission to use the data, to share the data. So this limits data sharing. Then the norm of keeping research data secured for only five years in many institutions can hinder long use of data and data sharing. Then we have the unique African perspective on data sharing. This is because um, Overseas published materials do not align with the African situation. And then the problems with language and consent for data collection and sharing, especially in the rural communities of Africa, impact of low research settings and so on. We are really unique African perspectives to data sharing. However, several of the participants, we are enthusiastic to see data African um, uh, to see uh, African database, the uh, human movement research database they being um, developed, they were like, if such a thing can be developed, it will help data sharing in Africa.
Now, what is the way forward? Besides addressing all these challenges we've mentioned, um, there is a need for, for societal and psychological shift through reorientation to encourage data sharing among human movement researchers and clinicians in Africa. So in conclusion, more barriers than facilitators to data sharing um, we are reported. However, if these challenges that we mentioned and barriers that we mentioned um, are attended to, there is hope that data sharing among women movement researchers in Africa will be greatly improved. Thank you. So this paper has been published. To get access to the full version, to the full manuscript, you can just scan this QR code and you will be able to read. Wow, uh, thank you. That was an incredibly interesting uh, presentation and I'm going to go and read that paper for sure. Um, just if anyone has questions again, please raise your hand or put it in the box. I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. Whilst we wait for people to ask questions. Um, I have a question, which as you spoke, um, it may have been in that table, um, but how did you go about finding people to interview? Was there specific organizations that you targeted or was it just, yeah, maybe you can explain a little bit around that. Thanks. I'll unmute. Just give me a second. I love it. You should be able to unmute. OK, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, for listening to the presentation. Thanks for the question. Um, we actually um, searched um, Google and also different institutions in African countries. We also went to the database of um, African scientists. So we had no specific organizations in mind. We just wanted to reach out to all the, as many researchers and clinicians in human movement um, as possible. And, but what one way, one thing we did was that we created a sample grid to make sure that each region in Africa is duly re fairly represented. So with that sample grid, we began to send emails in English and French to all the um, to as many um, contacts as we that we could get from ResearchGate, from Google Scholar, from African Scientist databases, and from the institution um, from the institutions that's the universities and research institutions we could get online. We sent several emails, and those that responded, yeah, we scheduled them for interview and the interview was done. Great, thank you. And um, did you find that, because sure you had your sampling strategy, but with the people that responded, did it remain fairly evenly distributed across the regions? I mean, I know you said not central. Yes, yes, that was the, 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 prob the, the problem was that um, we couldn't get a, we, we couldn't interview a, any participant from um, Central Africa because of we, we got them there about two responded participants uh, potential participants responded but they couldn't stay online because we used Microsoft Teams for the interview and they couldn't stay that's for us to be able to record because of internet issues and even when we, we tried to make long phone call that's to to do the interview over the phone, it wasn't successful. That we couldn't reach out to them, so that was the, mm. a, a big barrier. At the end of the day, we couldn't interview anyone from Central Africa. Even the person that we interviewed from the, the persons um, from Sudan, from Sudan, we only managed. It kept breaking. We had to, at the end of the day, use um, Microsoft um, Teams to be putting um, some together. That's the breaks together so that we can have um, real transcripts to analyze. Mm. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, it kind of speaks to the, the barriers that you found in research, you know, data sharing. If you can't even have a conversation with other people, then how do we, yeah. how do we share data? Oh, thanks. That was a very yeah. interesting presentation. We're going to move on to our third speaker this morning. 
um, of the session, Rafilwe Paswana Mafuya. She is from the SAMRC UJ Pan African Center for Epidemics Research Extramural Unit. Thanks. Good day. It is my pleasure to present on our project entitled Harnessing Large Underutilized uh, Available HIV Related Data and Relevant uh, Auxiliary Data on Key Populations to Evaluate the Potential Impact of HIV Responses in Generalized Epidemic Settings. My name is Rufilo Paswana Mafoya. I work for the SMRC UJ uh, PESA Extramural Unit. Uh, and I acknowledge the support of SAMRC in this work. Um, um, the study is being conducted by a multidisciplinary and multi-institutional team from various institutions locally and internationally. Uh, the objectives of the project are to, to build a flexible, uh, a comprehensive uh, key populations data warehouse with computational power to handle large integrated data sets and machine learning approaches to collect available HIV related relevant ocular data for key populations in South Africa from the year 2000 onwards and align the data warehouse to the uh, FAIR principles uh, as well as to populate the data uh, into the data warehouse. The scientific premise of this study, which we call the Boloka project, is reliance on general population oriented approach to guide programs has had limited impact in terms of HIV responses, especially in settings like Sub Saharan Africa, which are generalized epidemic settings. And we need to understand the degree to which a key population's tailored HIV response sensitive to heterogeneity can effectively and efficiently reduce HIV incidence. We seek to leverage uh, existing data uh, uh, to better understand the country and the HIV, I mean, the regional HIV epidemics uh, to effectively measure the population level impact of addressing the needs of those at highest risk, namely key populations. Um, in this regard, uh, we have uh, five stages that the project will undergo, uh, one being to develop meaningful uh, data partnerships uh, uh, requesting uh, 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 relevant heterogeneous data, uh, uh, screening data for inclusion and quality, cleaning it, as well as ensuring an effective uh, feedback loop. Uh, in terms of stage one, uh, we envisage uh, to engage with a range of stakeholders uh, at multiple uh, uh, levels representing a myriad of institutes and uh, to conduct a stakeholder analysis in order to understand the landscape of individuals and institutions relevant to key populations in South Africa. This will uh, build upon the investigators existing network of HIV practitioners, policymakers, and researchers. Uh, in terms of stage two, two, we seek to collate data with high variability in terms of source, type, structure, and format across places, times, and populations, which will allow for analysis beyond traditional methods. Uh, we will leverage our partnerships to gather data from multiple sources, including available HIV-related epidemiologic data for key populations, as well as routinely collected uh, programmatic data. And these are examples of uh, data types, uh, research data, program data, auxiliary data from various sources. Uh, in terms of stage th three, once the data is received, it will go through a process of screening and assessment before its inclusion in the data warehouse. Uh, figure four in the next slide uh, delineates the process which will be followed, and we have utilized these methods uh, in previous studies together with our the collaborators. Stage four uh, all involves all the clean data being converted into a standardized format to create a structured but flexible and updatable data warehouse. The resulting database will be responsive to the size and scope of the collected data. It will be dynamic and flexible to accommodate diverse data. And uh, the data 
warehouse will be utilized for various analysis to plan jointly with partners to answer key uh, research questions uh, and a set of or a suit of epidemiological methods for analysis uh, attuned to the structure of available data, including cross-sectional and longitudinal surveys, as well as going beyond traditional statistical methods will be employed, including small error estimations, transmission modeling, and application of machine learning techniques. Here are examples of indicators that will be uh, explored, and uh, uh, data will be analyzed at various levels with more granularity. And in terms of stage five, we want to translate the data into um, uh, 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 policies and programs uh, uh, to address real world problems uh, and an effective uh, uh, feedback loop will be ensured so that uh, uh, there's communication and engagement from beginning to the end to enable buy-in uh, and uh, uh, sustainability. There are planned initial analysis, including SI methods, mathematical modeling, surveillance systems, and data disaggregation. There's a range of key success factors that uh, have been uh, thought about in medium and, and long-term uh, impacts, uh, which uh, are highlighted on the slide. And on this note, I'd like to acknowledge all uh, you know the collaborators, the research team, and the institutions involved uh, in terms of the provision of resources. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rafael. Wow, well, that is going to be an incredible source of data. Um, I'm just going to open it up to questions from anyone in the chat or raise your hand. What I will ask so long, uh, Rafiwe, is that, I mean, this is clearly a massive undertaking um, and there's clearly a lot of planning going into it. What is your time frame um, for each stage or of the whole project? And I, I heard you mention something about sustainability. What is the plan for beyond the project for maintaining the, the database? Thanks. Oh, th thank you very much. Yes, it is indeed an ambitious and an innovative uh, project. Um, we have a range of data partners that we are working with, and for us, that's uh, uh, critical uh, for sustainability um, uh, because that will enhance co-ownership and uh, buy-in. And, and this being an open access data set that is aligned to fair principles will make it a, a community resource. Um, yeah, so, and I'm glad to mention that um, to date we have uh, been able to secure some of the data and uh, we, are, uh, we have already started with some initial analysis. Uh, what was your other question? Thanks. Um, time frame. What are you looking at in terms of how oh, long this will take? Five years. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's so interesting. Uh, the other question I had was around your key populations. What definition are you using to define key populations? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I expected it because I was just rushing through. Uh, <laughs> men who have sex with men, uh, female sex workers, um, uh, uh, injecting drug users, transgender people, as uh, described in uh, the National Strategic Plan of uh, for HIV, STI, and TB 2017-2022, which is being reviewed now. Mm, okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Rafiwe. That was really interesting. Um, right, our last speaker for this session. Uh, is Jerry Sigudla from the Mpumalanga Provincial Department of Health. Thanks. Jerry Sigudla. I am a public health official responsible for research in Mpumalanga province, and I'm hoping that our effort in developing uh, this model will contribute towards closing the gap um, between researchers and uh, decision makers so that research evidence is translated into practice and policy. So by definition, research uptake um, is a process by which knowledge generated through research 
enters the domain of audiences such as practitioners, scholars, and users, policymakers, in other agencies. Traditional researchers will produce research evidence um, that requires end users to have analytical skills and clinical knowledge necessary to adopt and implement the research evidence. In this instance, end users become involved um, at the tail end of the research uh, project when findings are ready for dissemination um, 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 through presentation or pub publication in academic journals. But the concept of research uptake is intended to close the gap by affording end users uh, an opportunity to be immersed um, in shaping the research project in one way or another. So in low research countries such as South Africa, implementing research uh, findings um, is actually impeded by quite a number of um, factors such as uh, shortage of research resources, um, lack of skills and other competing priorities. So in, the implication of low public health research uh, uptake um, is that return on research investment uh, remains low. So a discussion paper by Helen actually found that out of 1.5 million peer reviewed articles, 85% are not cited. So that means that potential world changing ideas are not getting into the public domain. So there is no clear linkage between health researchers, policymakers, health program developers, and practitioners, and which leads to no, no accountability from all relevant stakeholders. This study was aimed of, um, at resolving some of these issues by focusing on the emergence and the persistence of low research uptake to develop a simple model for the optimal uptake of public health research. So I'm from a province of 4.7 million people. Healthcare facilities is 220, 56% of the population live in rural areas. HIV prevalence is 17.3%. The average life expectancy is 64.5 years. The leading cause of death um, is still TB and we share borders with Mozambique and Switzerland. So despite all these factors, the majority of research in the province is conducted by students at 61%, um, mainly for academic papers, and then government um, conducts only 2% of the research or initiate 2% of the research which is conducted in the province. So in this research, we wanted to know what are some of the perception of stakeholders with regard to research uptake, and what are some of the factors, what are the main factors that actually influence our research uptake and what should the model uh, for uptake of health research consist of. So it was a mixed method research design, but some of the findings um, were not new basically. We found that this lack of awareness of research results, our uh, researchers were not providing feedback on research conducted, um, there was lack of a champion to lead engagements among research stakeholders. Researchers also failed to align public health research projects to existing local context and available resources. This inability to establish and sustain beneficial collaborations. Um, the correlation coefficient confirms six factors that affect research updates, which are uh, support, experience, motivation, time factor, resources, and critical appraisal skills. So the model actual talk of um, says that uh, research uptake is the function of the relationship between three domains, which is evidence, context, and facilitation. It says that with evidence, we need clarity about the strength of the evidence um, that is going to be produced. This can be attained by involving um, relevant stakeholders during the planning stage of the research process. And by context, we talk of a clarity about the environment in which research uptake should take place. Um, this is enabled by the availability of a local research committee and the research um, database. There are a number of strategies that need to be in place for research uptake uh, to happen. So, Firstly, the research agenda and priorities must be developed, uh, capacity building strategy, appraisal strategy, communication strategy, and stakeholder engagement strategy. So these are some of the strategies that must be, must be in place for research uptake to happen. So by facilitation, we talk of the clarity in terms of um, 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 the methods which are necessary uh, for the translation of research evidence into uh, practice and 
and policy. Um, here you will need the critical appraisal skills, um, you will need the active engagement processes to be in place, we need the timeless feedback sessions to, um, to be in place. So, but we're seeing at the end, we must see an improved in terms of service delivery, we must see improved in research capacity, we must see improved in health systems. So with this model, end users of research are mainly involved throughout the research cycle. The model requires several strategies to be developed, and then we are saying that timeless feedback and consistent engagements are the cornerstones of the research uptake model. Integrated health partnerships. Integrated partnerships approach is also to go. We want to acknowledge the MEC and the head health from Mumalanga province, Professor Mawiz from the University of South Africa, Dr. Lucia from the University of Aberdeen, and all the study participants for agreeing to be part of the process and sharing their time. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jerry. That was a, also very interesting and nice to see what's happening um, here in South Africa around um, research and research uptake. Some important themes that were echoed by the previous speakers. Um, I see we've got Alna's hand up. Um, Alna, we will unmute you. And then Tamara. Samaya, you can unmute them. Uh, Elna, you can go ahead. Uh, Elna, you just need to unmute yourself. We've made it uh, available. Hi, good morning. Sorry, can you hear me? It's Elna yes, Davies we, we can hear you. Thanks, Elna. Go for it. Uh, Dr. Jerry, I found that a very, very, very insightful um, presentation. Thank you so much. I have moved from the research environment to come and assist with the COVID vaccination project in a at a private facility. And uh, yeah, your presentation is very on point on on what is needed to to um, to create that kind of research uptake and uh, collaboration partnership. So thank you very much. I just wanted to say thanks. Thanks, Alna. I agree. Very on point. Um, Tamara? Thanks very much. Um, yeah, great session. And thanks, Dr. Sigudla. I mean, it was awesome. I'm, I'm Tamara Credo. I'm based at Cochrane, South Africa. It was also music to my ears because it's our, our daily bread and butter at the Cochrane Centre. And I think generally increasingly researchers wanting to, you know, work with those that will use the evidence. And, and not do research for researchers sake sake. And I was struck by that, you know, the Hileta data were 1.5 million, you know, papers that are not cited at all. And I think it really falls into the field of, of research waste. You know, how do we avo avoid spending the limited resources we have doing research that's not going to be answering questions that we need? And yeah, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm yeah, I'm curious to hear what are the next steps with collaborations for you and the team there and and yeah, opportunities to collaborate across provinces. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Dr. Jerry, you just need to unmute yourself, please. Well, um, I'm sorry that I could not hear um, the comments because of the network. So, um, but then what I can indicate is that we we really need research that matters in Mpumalanga province. Um, we, we don't have resources as we have seen. Um, we rely mostly, most of our research is conducted by students and, and, and also organizations and, and, and universities. So with partnerships, I think we can at least try to cover some of the gap that we have. Um, we are in the process now of developing uh, our research uh, priorities so that maybe uh, once we have our research agenda, we'll be able to say, you know, students, if you want to do research in Pumalanga, 
this is the, uh, the, 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 the researches that you can pick um, so that you can assist the department um, in, in order for it to improve you know, patient care through the research that you're conducting. And yeah, also with regard to, we have been struggling with regard to feedback from researchers, um, um, which I think perhaps if maybe universities are here, they can also assist in terms of encouraging the students to return um, uh, uh, feedback to the provinces, you know, that they've conducted the research to. We approve studies. We have really simplified the process of getting approval, especially in Pumalanga province. Uh, we monitor our database every week so that we encourage researchers to come in. But then at the end of the, the day, when they have, they have done collecting information, you hardly hear them even reporting back, you know, to the province. So these are some of the things that I've, I've said that I'm appreciating this kind of an opportunity because I know that maybe I'm sharing with the right people um, in this platform. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, such a good point about students giving feedback on the outcomes. I think often as a student, you just want to pass and get done and then you don't think actually this would be valuable to share. So thanks for that. And I hope anyone who's listening that is doing anything with students also heard that. Um, we've got a little bit of time left, so if anyone has any questions about any of the um, presentations we've had in this session, uh, let me um, put your hand up or put in the chat. Just give it a minute. Oh, less than a minute. Um, coming up after lunch, so we have lunch break from 12 until 1, and then from 1 until 2, we have our first post decision session around COVID-19 and infectious diseases, which should be very interesting. And then from um, 2 until 4 this afternoon, we have our first plenary. Um, so that will be really, really good to attend, so please do. Otherwise, we will see you at one o'clock after lunch. Um, I'll still be around for a little while if there's any questions. Otherwise, see you after, um, after lunch. Thanks, everyone.